Welcome everybody to this research seminar with uh, Jart Helgesson. So I'm going to speak about uh, a controversial topic dealing with the university's historical heritage, ethical quandaries. Jart is a professor uh, uh, at the Stockholm Center for Healthcare Ethics uh, at the Karolinska Institute, also at Lyme, as it says on your, on your PowerPoint. Uh, he defended his... Uh, dissertation on value assumption in economic theory at Uppsala University in 2002, I think, which supervisor was Sven Danielsson, same supervisor I had, actually, but also Sven over Hansen, I think, was yeah. involved, yeah. exactly. But since then, you have turned uh, most of your focus to uh, medical ethics and research ethics. You published a book, actually, on research ethics. I think the only book, or the first book I saw on research ethics in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, which I can recommend. Uh, and you also have done stuff on clinical ethics, uh, on uh, this autonomy and decision-making capacity, uh, and uh, this idea of patient-centered patient healthcare and informed consent. But, uh, and you published it in this area, but then you got this, which you will tell us more about, this mission from the vice chancellor of the Karolinska Institute to solve all the problems with this kind of problem of names from former researchers that have had views that we don't find so appetizing these days and busts and different things. So welcome very much and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you again for <laughs> having me here. Um, uh, before uh, we get started, I, I want to say a few things. I want to say that, uh, first of all, uh, what I present today is not part of my research, not part of my teaching. It's fallen up on me, I would say, because I'm a um, professor of medical ethics and also a member of the Ethics Council. So wha what I will present is uh, some past work, some upcoming work in this working group that was appointed by the president of KI, he likes to be called that, uh, and shared by uh, me. Um, the, the importance of the work has, has been stressed repeatedly by th the university, but I just want to say that we have quite limited resources. B what have been clearly financed are, uh, is work by historians uh, of science uh, to, uh, in, in the second part, for instance, that we're working with now, what is actually in these anatomical collections that I will talk about. Uh, and earlier on, what was the history of uh, naming, how did, what had happened in the past, etc. So I want to say this just to get some realistic uh, expectations of what you can come of, expect to come out from, from this working group that uh, where most of the work is voluntary and, and non-funded, basically. <coughs> okay, I want to start here uh, by saying that there is a long tradition uh, at many universities to celebrate their own heroes of the past, not least important researchers and their contributions uh, to either society or, or to uh, knowledge development. And this is, uh, I would say, part of creating a self-image. So what you celebrate, by celebrating the heroes of the past, this sort of point that this is what we are, this, this is who we are. Uh, and celebration of old heroes is, of course, typically done with fo focus exclusively on the upside. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a celebration, right? So, so you, you point at at the good sides, and if there is something else, you don't uh, say much about that. And this is, of course, what you do also as a university when you're trying to establish your own importance by pointing at uh, leading individuals. And this way, who you are as a university, in a sense, gets entangled with who they were, these past heroes. And I would say here is a risk, of course, uh, 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 namely that you're entangling your reputation with that of others. That has a risk side. So what if those others weren't as great as you thought? Uh, what are we paying tribute to then and, and what should we do about it? So this has been uh, the issue in several debates around the world following Black Lives Matter, I think to some extent uh, before uh, the Black Lives Matter events last oh, two years ago. Um, so focus has sort of shifted uh, in the debate but from police brutality in the streets to statues in peaceful university parks and names on streets and lecture halls. 
And of course, these contested heroes have usually been great in some respects. They've done something that has been of value, but they have also some less attractive sides. And the question is, how should you handle this disparity? And this, of course, gets especially sensitive when the downside concerns, say, sympathy with slavery, as the case of Hume, or concerns the Nazi sympathies with the Nazi regime, or diminishing treatment of already suppressed mm. indigenous people, for instance. Judge, since we have an interdisciplinary mm? audience, maybe you should tell everybody who Hume is. Most oh, David Hume, um, um, one of the uh, most celebrated uh, philosophers at all times, I would say. Uh, so this is the context of, um, of this working group on uh, KI's historical heritage, uh, appointed by the president in October 2020. And the mission was to contribute, actually primarily, I think, to the internal debate. It's certainly been external as well. Uh, the internal debate on its historical heritage, and in particular in relation to racism, and to deliver suggestions on a number of specific issues, uh, how to handle historical monuments, busts of uh, Retsius, etc., how to handle names of streets in the campus area, lecture halls, etc., and also how to handle the anatomical collections. And the work was divided into two parts, so the first two points have been handled and the anatomical collections and repatriation issues are on the table right now. So in this first part uh, where the report has been written, uh, we identified three, I guess, quite obvious main options for handling names on buildings, streets, etc. Such Retsius Weg, Samuelsson Salen, Samuelsson Lecture Hall, etc. Keep them all, replace them all, or replace some and keep the rest. And uh, these options were considered with some thoughts in mind. If you put a person's name on a building, lecture hall, etc., that is a way to pay tribute to that person. I mean, why else would you do it? So uh, just you need to recognize that. And you also need to recognize that what ideas you have yourself about why you're putting the name there uh, is not necessarily how it is perceived by others. So, okay, I may uh, use a personal name to pay tribute to scientific achievements and others may perceive this as cherishing racists or Nazis. There is no way you can control the perception. And among the most controversial names that were discussed at Karolinska Institute, that there were uh, two persons, father and son, Retsius, uh, Anders and Gustav, uh, tied to race research and arguably to race biology. And it's been debated to what extent they were racist, rather than whether they were that at all. There was also another name von Euler, again, father and son, research-wise very impressive, both Nobel uh, Prize laureates, the father being one of Sweden's most vigorous and leading supporters of the Nazi regime in Germany. And of course, there are complications here if you want to consider whether to use personal names on buildings, etc. One is that clarifying historical facts may be genuinely difficult, and that I think uh, Her Heretius really is a, a case in point. What if a bad reputation is most likely unfounded, but it remains contested, and the public perception is that the historical person was a villain? And what is reasonable to do that? I'm not saying that this applies to Retius, but I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, it's a kind of problem that you might face. Uh, what if a name has come to be associated with something, say ri race biology, by being a predecessor, yet distinct, and some distinguishing, distinguishing values were not shared? Or perhaps they were shared to some extent. I mean, it, it, this could vary. Uh, so, uh, so there are problems that relate to getting clear about the facts and how to handle them. And then, of course, valuing important scientific contributions against inclinations to racism or disrespect for other people is arguably a tricky thing. How should that be done? If you have research that are on one hand, there is something to celebrate about them, and there is something else that you may not be as proud about. 
I mean, is it, for instance, always okay to publicly pay tribute to great scientific contributions, regardless of what other things that person accomplished or stood for? Let me just pick a little bit of information from this promemoria that was written by Peter Hellström, a uh, uh, historian of science. Uh, uh, I have a, a, link, a link to that at the end of, of the presentation. Uh, uh, he writes, there is no doubt that Andrzejewski played a decisive and important role in the early development of KI. Nor is there any doubt that Gustav Rezius left important contributions to neurology and histology. He was, in fact, nominated for the Nobel Prize 23 times, and that this never had anything to do with, with race research, but to neurology and histology. At the same time, there is no doubt that Anders and Gustav Rezius are central figures in the history of Swedish racism. Not because they were more prejudiced or intolerant than other Swedes at the time, but because they, in contrast to most other people, spent a lot of their life work trying to prove and support ideas of their times on biologically distinct races by help of methods of the natural sciences. As did others, Anders Gustav Rezius divided people into races based on body measurements and spoke of these races in value-loaded and far from innocent words. So what did we do about this <laughs> in the uh, working group? Well, uh, the, the solution we proposed is at the bottom here. We opted for replace all personal names. And, and the considerations that we had was to sum up the, the fact-related reasons I mentioned about avoiding names. At times it's very difficult to settle what was indeed true of the proposed individuals. And there are value-related reasons to avoid using names, we argued. It's difficult to balance good and bad aspects. It's, it may even be difficult to know how to do that. Jack, could you explain what you mean, replace all personal names? Is that replacing with names that are not personal, or is it replaced with other personal names? No, no, uh, okay, good. Uh, no, no, we suggested that you shouldn't use personal names anymore. Uh, 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 to use a, a pun in the Swedish, instead of saying Anders Rezius Weg, you could use Jean Wegen or, 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 or some, something medical, or I think when they discussed naming of streets when these names first were in place, uh, as a working progress they used animal names, which perhaps would be less relevant. But you, you could have names of diseases, you could have names of, of medical areas or things like that. But so replacing... The name of Rietjus' dog would be okay. What now? The yeah. name of Rietjus' dog would be okay. That's yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like a personal name, but I guess that could be debated. Uh, uh, anyway, and the also, I mean, uh, apart from this fact-related reason, value-related reasons, you had this control of image and Im or image reasons as well. What you mean by a name is not necessarily what others take it to mean, which means that if, if you want to control your image, which is certainly a part of this for all universities and are discussing this, you, you can't do that uh, if, if you're using personal names because you don't know how they will be perceived regardless of what you self think. And of course, it's, you could argue, it's generally difficult to know what to think about use of Nobel Prize winners who also uh, or not, well maybe that's not the most difficult problem, but when, when it's unclear what you actually did, what you actually, what your values were, some claims that you were a racist, some claims you were doing race biology, others would say no, this is before race biology, you were doing race anthropology, which is something different, etc., etc. Uh, they, were, they were actually understudies, were actually doing some interesting work. It's, it's the kind of work that we all have found in our school books, namely uh, the, the population movements. Uh, who, when did the, the Indo-Europeans enter Europe? Who were there before? What happened? Etc. Uh, so that was uh, his main interest, it seems. Uh, the proposal we had certainly doesn't come out by necessity. You have figured that out already. I mean, we could as well have uh, suggested that you should replace the, the most obviously bad names and kept the others. And then, of course, 
then you would have to bite the bullet and accept that you have all these difficulties that we that we listed. That could have been an uh, an alternative. I think an, an additional consideration from us was that we wanted to avoid the mess of that sort of cultural battlefield. Who should be paid tribute? Who are worthy? That kind of question. I mean, should you list? Should a set of men? Should you, should you have on the names, buildings, lecture halls, a set of men chosen by another set of men in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s? Uh, because it, it's, it's a detail here, but uh, there is no long tradition at Karolinska Institute to have these personal names. There were a few that have been there uh, around 40s or so, but most names were put there in late 1990s and early only uh, 200. So it's it's not that we are breaking with a long tradition by removing them. They were fairly recently put there. Um <coughs> I mean, and so one is who, how should, what kind of procedure should you have, uh, and uh, I mean, who should decide what are the most foremost, uh, the foremost uh, research contributions? Is there even reason to believe that we would agree? And should it be? Should it be only research contributions? Maybe we should have uh, sort of by the names on campus, you should uh, sort of illustrate all the activities on the university. Maybe you should have some people, influential people from the administration. You should have some teachers. Maybe you should have some physicians, nurses who also were active at the university side but made greater contributions in healthcare. So, so uh, this is a battle, and it's clear that this is a battle since people have been so very angry <laughs> with uh, our suggestion to remove ma names. Um, um, removing personal names and buildings, uh, on buildings and streets, uh, how does that really relate to one argument that we face, namely that we are proposing to erase history? Um, maybe it's course my background in uh, sort of analytical philosophy I don't can't even see how you can get this idea I mean history cannot be erased what happened happened uh, but what what you could uh, influence of course is the use we make of history and there it's not obvious how how we should use history uh, so at least my my take on on some of the arguments is that uh, talk of erasing history is mainly rhetoric used by those who want to keep exactly the present names. Uh, one might as well claim that all people who do not name lecture halls or streets have always been erased from history, which sort of further stressed, uh, I think, the stupidity of that argument. Um, <coughs> we stress that the report in the report that if, if the names policy was kept, then there are reasons to make a fresh start on whom to celebrate and honor. <coughs> you can have a milder argument in, instead of saying that we're erasing history. You could argue that, and people did, that removing personal names from campus makes history less visible. Uh, and I mean, that's to some extent true. I think naming names doesn't help much to get to make history visible. But uh, it's, it's, uh, um, you could argue that it's a step back instead of a step forward. So we suggested that uh, initiatives be taken to make KI history more present in our daily lives, for instance, through informative exhibitions, etc. You might even use modern technology to have historical points on campus, so when you walk around and use an app, you can get historical information on what happened at that part. Of that. So there, there are many ways to make it more visible. Using names is not among uh, the most useful, I think. <coughs> there were actually other considerations as well, and maybe this is the one that made uh, uh, most people at KI who, who got angry the angriest, uh, namely uh, that we were a little bit questioning the idea that the, uh, the story uh, about modern science should be told through individuals. So is individual genius or strong individuals the most accurate way to understand scientific development? We were skeptical. So th this was sort of a, s uh, a side reflection. Uh, and uh, I remember in some of the discussions we had 
the argument, but then we might as well remove the Nobel Prize, and you can hear sort of the sound uh, with, this, with this was said. And I think, yes, that's a good conclusion. Then you have uh, understood the argument we had. If, if you think it's a bad idea to single-handedly tell the sort of story of scientific progress through individuals, then the Nobel Prize isn't a great tool either, because it also stresses that thing, um, or that view. <coughs> so if I understand some of the not so happy reactions to our suggestions and reason correctly this question about how to understand the driving forces of progress in science, this was very personal to some people and, and very emotional. They were almost yelling at me even though it was sort of a, 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 a formal meeting. But they, so, so you can, I was a bit surprised actually, I thought you could disagree with me be without getting angry. Um, um, uh, anyway, uh, some describe this proposal as pure madness <laughs> in news media. I don't, I don't know. W your view is on pure madness, but uh, I think my understanding is that what they wanted to say is we don't like it. Uh, th uh, that's what it, uh, and they didn't, of course. Uh, uh, so, th so this is the the kind of different. It was many things that appeared here and. Uh, I was surprised by some of these things. Then I, I think I must say that when we had written the report, we were a little bit disappointed at ourselves. Um, we had the idea that we should be very short about argumentation. No one uh, apart from philosophers are interested in argumentation anyway. But I think afterwards we were so short that it became unclear what was the argument. So, so I, thi I, I must say we we failed in writing that well, and I think that made uh, the debates afterwards even messier than they would have been. So uh, uh, a little bit more space on thorough argumentation would have helped and not, uh, not increased uh, confusion, I think. So the naughty us on that point. Um, so this is, this is the what the first part has been about. The, the, the second part is about the human anatomical collection and as the first part, the, the topics are, of course, not something that we are alone about. Many large universities have anatomical collections if they have a medical faculty. Uh, some have much larger collections than uh, KI. Um, but so we are, we are looking at that. Um, uh, how was it collected? I mean, what is, what do we have now in in this collection, how was it collected and how should it be handled today? That's the, the general questions. And uh, there are interesting things to say, I think, about how the collection was built. The worst images you get, which are true, is that you would have these expeditions to uh, sort of abandon graveyards and dig up corpses uh, or if they were, I think they were pretty old, uh, so they you would dig up bones, but you would actually sort of plunder a graveyard to get uh, material for your collection. You were buying, selling, you were um, uh, picking up people who died without relatives or at worst with relatives, but they were poor enough not to really count. So there were, as far as I understand, situations where the doctor could say, we'll have this body for our anatomical collections, and relatives didn't have a say. So, th so there, there were remarkable uh, aspects of collecting. Um, the question now, when it's here, I mean, should it be kept? Should, it be, should everyone be buried, or should you do something else? And one of the something else's is repatriation, where a group of people claim to have some members of the collection uh, returned to them. There have been a couple of those two um, regional populations in North America, Australia, New Zealand. And there are there is one discussion now that it's not Urefolk, uh, uh, but uh, Swedish. Swedish Finns that uh, they th I think this it was one of these expeditions to a graveyard in Finland where um, where they p 
people in Sweden uh, originating from Finland uh, request that these are returned. Uh, it, it turns out that it's legally more complicated when it's not a minority or, or the original population because then there is very little in terms of legal support for, for telling how you should do this. But things will happen. Probably the Finnish government will talk to the Swedish government and they will tell KI what to do. Uh, my guess is that these will be returned. But how is of course still a question. Should just should they all be burned, uh, buried or should they be kept in Finland instead of in Sweden or what should happen? Um, <coughs> there are other issues. I mean the sort of cultural historical use, what is at all acceptable. I guess you remember a couple of years ago when there was an art exhibition of corpses. Uh, which is sort of an extreme use, but is it okay f to make historical exhibitions where you uh, display skulls, organs, whatever you may find in this? Or is it morally wrong uh, for some reason? And what about use for research? Is that okay or is it is okay on certain conditions but not otherwise? And if so, what what should these conditions be? What we have learned so far from the about the collection is that uh, the, this collection contains remains from about 800 individuals, mainly skulls and bones. Uh, in an international comparison, I think this makes the collection quite small. There are very few, and much fewer than expected, uh, at least than I expected, from urfolk, I mean original inhabitants or recognized minorities, less than 10. And what I'm talking about now is Samis, Jews, Tone uh, Dalingar, um, Romis, uh, uh, and Swedish Finns. Uh, no Swedish Finns, no Romis, one skull from a Jewish woman, one for sure Sami, maybe some more, for Kvener, which is a, another population group uh, from way up north uh, that are represented by Tony Dahlinger. So uh, I guess if we thought this would be a practical problem, I guess one easy way of handling this is, well, uh, if you want them back, please take it uh, and we will arrange that. It, it's, it's, it will not make a great difference to the bulk of what's in, in the collections, but it could be that you have uh, uh, original inhabitants from other parts of the world where it actually could be more individuals. <coughs> there may be some research interest tied to the collection, but my impression after having talked to some research is that it's probably not of great interest to anatomical, pathological or genetic research. Uh, but it may still be interesting for research and exhibitions wh when the research has to do with the use of anatomical collections in, in uh, medicine historically, that kind of stuff. There are some skulls from the Bronze Age and in Siberia, uh, but it seems that the research interest is very strongly tied here as many other places to being first. So if you have characterized the genome for a certain group, it seems that the interest for that group dies very quickly. I mean, there could be other interests. Um, in, in if you have large anatomical collections, you can actually also study diseases. I think they in, uh, in Denmark they have collections where they had done research on Spanska sjuka, was that Spanish? The Spanish flu, where you can have traces of that uh, on the skeletons of of the remains. So, so there are interests like that. It's unclear whether there is anything of interest in the KI collection. The KI collection has been done, it seems like, it's a little bit like you want to have someone from each part of, of the world. So you have, you have a considerable spread but there are quite few individuals from each place, apart from 
actually Sweden, where most of, of the remains uh, originate. Okay, so uh, I'm approaching the end here, but uh, so what, what we uh, have done, we have met researchers uh, with potential interest, we have met legal re experts on law concerning collections, seems to be very little to go on when it comes to firm regulation. We will have a public seminar March 29th. Uh, we have communication with folk and minority populations to make sure they don't think we're doing something they don't like. Uh, uh, to get the opportunity of, of uh, their, them telling us. There will be a report written this spring or summer. It goes public in August and after that sometime there will be decisions made by the president of, of KI on on policies. So that's that's where we stand. And if you want to read more, you can actually enter just a KI web page. Uh, if we want to, g I either you use this address, I can make sure you get the PowerPoints, or you Google uh, Retsius uh, on the KI. Uh, I think you will end up here. Uh, I think uh, one of the best things of the first part wasn't really our report, to be honest, but the work uh, Peter Hellström did, the historical work that he did, that's worth reading uh, regardless of what you think about our report and certainly regardless of what you think about our conclusions, because that's, uh, that's uh, the common ground for discussions. What is there, what can you say about the people that have been uh, questioned, etc. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome back to the question period. And uh, we have an audience online and we have an audience here. So for you uh, online, uh, we use the chat function. So if you uh, wish to ask a question, you should write that in the chat. And since we are a mix of researcher from different fields, also tell me uh, what area of study, what your research field is. So we can take questions from different disciplines. So write your name and area of study. And we also take follow-up questions. So that is with a finger if you're here, or you write follow-up and then to the person you're following up to in the chat. Uh, we are a bit unsure about uh, the quality of the connection for the people online. So if we get a problem that we will ask you to write the questions instead and I will read them out. But uh, let's see, but, but uh, please uh, write in the chat if you want to ask a question. We will start with the most honorable former colleague of Judge well, actually, not just former uh, colleague. We are actually in the same uh, ethics council at COE. I'm not, though, in the group. So, so you're not responsible for this? Uh, well, I'm indirectly responsible for this, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so I, I was just thinking it might be useful if you actually explain what the uh, uh, president decided to do, right? Because I think it's a bit of a mix-up in the debate what <coughs> The, this group proposed to the mm -hmm. president and actually what the president decided to do and on what grounds. As far as I remember, the idea is actually to take away some names, right, Rexus, for instance, replace it by Caesar. That doesn't seem to be good. The Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> Aula. <laughs> okay. Uh, but keep the name of the Institute, Karolinska, right? Celebrating mm. two Swedish kings. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, mm. And, uh, um, uh, and also uh, start a discussion, right? In the in KI about the principles for name giving, right? Uh, I think that's the rough mm. decision, right? He made. Uh, so, so my question to you was just that: How much of your decisions were sort of just sort of in a way pragmatic? Now we, we need some kind of quick sort of fix here when it comes to certain burning issues like the Retzius names, for instance, right? Or von von Uller as well. Uh, and how much was sort of principle ideas about? how we should deal with this issue in society as a whole, right? It's the idea that this, what you actually concluded should be applied outside KI2 uh, for all the linear, you know, linear university, <coughs> all these uh, various uh, historical names, yes. mm. <laughs> roads and stuff like that. Should they, so the principle be to try to get rid of those two. Or was this just very contextual? Uh, uh, that's what was my understanding, actually. That it was um. sort of contextual, yeah. Well, I, I think one, one thing that made a difference was that uh, if, you are, if you're in a working group, either you, you try to make a consensus decision or you decide not to do that and are clear that you don't. So uh, 
m maybe some of the members would find more than one solution acceptable. What was absolutely clear was that no one found the idea that to keep all names acceptable. But it's worth noting that there are people at KI who thought that would be uh, the, the best uh, solution. So the, the views have, have been on all ends uh, here. Um, uh, well, we had discussions on whether uh, you can, I mean, we, we thought it was an important idea that it's uh, a celebration, that you're actually making a statement. And of course, you could argue for some, say, statues outside university areas that they're they're just there. It was a statement once, now it doesn't mean very much. Maybe, maybe that's how I think about at least some of the uh, lesser known Swedish kings. If there is a statue somewhere around Stockholm, maybe it doesn't mean much more than, well, once upon a time we put up statues for our kings. It, it's not clear that we still celebrate that king. I think you can't... Mm, mm, yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure I answered uh, all of you. How much do you think it should be applied since you don't know the name? Um. So I think the question was, I mean, is this just a quick uh, pragmatic solution just for these issues with Retius, or is this a more general thing for the whole of Karolinska or, uh, or even, even outside KI? <laughs> no, but that's good. Um, I'm <laughs> not really sure how strongly we felt about the answer to that question. I think what uh, what I think is important is to bring out what are the the aspects of keeping names or or removing names. That there are all those things that I brought up. Uh, for instance, if we continue with this celebrating with the individuals, of course we will for sure continue with the Nobel Prize. Is that is that good to sort of further push that view on research? I mean, you could have other views on research. For instance, that, well, uh, um, luck plays a great role in exactly who uh, comes up with things. It's a greater factor than any successful academic person has ever wanted to admit. Uh, but also that you have sort of historic or some more broad, uh, broader changes. Like uh, you had Pasteur and Koch are celebrated for, uh, for uh, teaching us about the microorganisms, but it's pretty likely that it would have been someone else if they did. I mean, then, then someone else would have done it. And that goes for, for quite a lot. So, so what are we, is it really true then that the progress in science is driven by particularly smart individuals. Uh, so it's a little bit a question of how, how science works. That's, that's one aspect. But then, of course, the celebration issue is important. But what you should do if, if I don't personally didn't feel very strongly about which option, maybe you could argue even that it's better that you insist on keeping names because then you have to deal with the question of, of who should be celebrated. Is it reasonable to have a university, but everyone is just celebrated for their research achievements? Uh, so if, if you think, I mean, maybe not so many at K, I think this, but there are many others who think that the uh, basic idea of a university is teaching. Uh, so, so there are things like that. Um, uh, well, that's as good as I can answer right now, I think. Maybe I could uh, follow up on this mm -hmm. because uh, I mean, as, as you said, this raises a lot of very interesting questions and mm. that one can have different opinions on, but that one can also argue about. And I quickly looked at a report, and, and maybe it's a bit unfair, but I thought that the solution you go for is what you can call the, the, the lazy solution. You just get rid of everything. Mm. Whereas mm. there has been similar problems before, and you touched upon that with the Nobel Prize. And what do you do for people? There's also going to be extremely contested. Mm -hmm. Who should get an oil prize? And there have been prizes given in the past that we now find quite embarrassing. Well, the idea is, and one can draw on uh, democratic theory, which I, I, I didn't see much in the, in the report, that it, you need to have a procedure that gives legitimacy to the choice. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would have expected that you would have talked a little bit about that, that, that it seems that the right thing to do here is to find a procedure, as you have done with the Nobel Prize, 
that uh, especially in the natural sciences that has been now perceived as oh is is done so well so that gives kind of mm. legitimacy to the choice and you could do likewise for naming principles but i didn't see much of a discussion on that in no, the to be honest you didn't see very much of uh, any interesting discussion <laughs> it, 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 i mean afterwards uh, you ha i think you have to say that it's it was way too short uh, and i think uh, the idea in the group was well if it's short, some people will read it, or if it's not, they won't. But the problem, what, what we achieved with that was that we were utterly unclear about almost all, all the arguments. We sort of pity when there was actually work done to go through the literature, uh, not democratic theory, but uh, quite a lot of others, what had been written around uh, statues, etc., historical... Uh, I mean, from for instance, picking up from this uh, the war ethics. What, how should you uh, the cultural heritage? How should you think about uh, those things? So I, but we did have a suggestion, but uh, we didn't even spell out very much what the instructions would be. But we had the idea that there should be, if they didn't follow our main suggestions, you should have a committee, a permanent committee deciding on on names but we said very little on instructions for that because we i think you're right in saying that we left most of that work to someone else okay, thank you. No, so, so that i think but, but be i interesting think thing yeah. to, because i mean it's not a new problem and there, there are some no. in the neighborhood and, and the Nobel prize had some problems before they got mm. their procedure and i think a lot of the prestige of the Nobel prize is actually because of the procedure mm. seen as mm. mm. okay KI is actually doing that now, right? They, they're discussing the principles for name giving. Yes, as far as but I haven't seen a decision on. N no, on but, but I thought the idea is to make some kind of have some procedure right around mm. it, right? Yeah, Which that is would in be line the with their point. Gustav's mm. um, comment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but I, I want to add that I think also, we, I mean, we had the fear that if we wouldn't go for our solution, just remove them and make up something else, diseases or organs or something from medicine, then uh, you wouldn't deal with uh, uh, our question. I, and, I, and for what has happened since the decision that fear has been sort of supported, namely that, yeah, you remove one or two people, maybe you don't even remove everything with Retsius. You take something to make, oh, now we did this, and then you leave everything. And then you still have the problems of representation, etc. The, the which is of the, the cultural war here, I guess. Yeah, also that there's so many other solutions. The problem mm. with your suggestion taking away old names is you can't celebrate women and other oppressed groups, which is a very good idea to do, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah, so sure. you take away that possibility too? Yes. Okay. Patrick. Yes, so I'm interested in this culture war issue uh, of this question because there, there seems to be two sides, right? There's one extreme side that says keep everything and there's another extreme side that says remove uh, all the racists and so forth. And you, your nuclear option to remove all the names gave one of these sides everything they wanted to have all these names removed. And th this choice, I mean, I... I I'm surprised that you are surprised from the reactions to this, because it would seem like <coughs> the self-evident thing to mm. way to react. So my question is, how do you? No, I think you if the um, um, the sort of, sort of enemies of Retius or what you should call, it, if they would have had their way fully, we we would just say that it was uncomplicated. They were all terrible racists. Uh, and if you uh, if you read uh, Petter, and we we just summarized uh, on a couple of pages uh, his report, H he says, well, it's much more complicated, because their view was there's since he was racist, he didn't do anything good. I mean, the the very simplified. There, there's there's nothing more to say of a person if if was racist, and then it's it's not very clear. Uh, uh, where they stood, they weren't they weren't active racists. They didn't suggest any policies. So that, I mean, there are many levels of being racist, and their connection connection to race, biology, and Uppsala is not that strong. I mean, it it ties into the history of 
racism in Sweden in the sense that first you have these, then you had these, then you had these, and these last ones were really bad. It uh, doesn't say that uh, everyone in that chain were the same. So I, th I think they wanted more. Um, what is more? In this case? They, they, wanted, uh, they wanted the report to say, uh, it's clear that they were racist, there's nothing more to say about Retius, for instance. I don't think they knew about von Euler. That was uh, a thing that the historian found. There are other names that are also tricky. Yes, you the person was a member of a organization where you had quite a few of racists, but you or no Nazis, but you also had other things they did where you can question what was that really their interest or was their interest to help general health in Sweden, etc. Uh. Happy with that answer? No. <laughs> so follow up quickly. No, I, did, I, I think still, I mean, removing all the names is still giving one of the sides the option they wanted to, which was to remove all the names. Uh, that they thought problematic and this in this way you kind of made a clean sweep of it all and I, s I, I, I don't see that you have argued for okay the superiority I of this okay I see but I, can I will only re I only repeat myself I, I don't okay. think uh, I they were uh, since they weren't pleased uh, either I assume that we didn't go their way yeah. either that's good. That's an interesting answer. You have a quick thing on this? Yeah. Wasn't it the case that they uh, talking Wasn't the it the case first? that that this group they wanted to remove all and only these names? And if so, then that would be. Mm -hmm. Good. So then next here we we also can take questions from the online people, but so far I only have questions from people here. And the next one is uh, Joran. Thank you. That was very interesting. I uh, I was wondering whether you could say a little bit more about the standard that you're using when you uh, that you were using when you came to the removal names uh, option, because it sounds like sometimes the relevant consideration is whether it's in the interest of KI specifically. Sometimes it sounds like it's about whether these people deserve to be commemorated. And sometimes it's what's good or bad for society generally. So do you want to have all of these or is it one in particular that was important in your reasoning? Um, no, I think you're right that there were several uh, several con considerations. And I, th I think the sort of, if it's a critique, the sort of pragmatic uh, remark, there is something to that. We wanted to suggest something where Whereas we can't really say that from these considerations one follows. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, there, there is always a, a factor at universities to look at perception of the universities. So it, 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 it wasn't in our mission to care about that, but of course we, we knew that was, that was one aspect, sure. But I mean, the the interest of the working group uh, in that sense, of course, w was similar to that of, say, Central Ki. That if there were some really uh, some names that looked really bad, uh, it was reasonable that they should be removed. So, uh, and if you do that for for other reasons than your image, you do something about the image at the same time, of course. So the question is, uh, it's I it will be interesting. Uh, to see, okay, so wait another year and see what did they actually do? Is it true that they m removed some Retius name and not others? Why couldn't they at least take everything from Retius and, and von Euler? Or, or do as some suggested, I guess that would be reasonable if you keep names, namely that, okay, but if, if one of the von Eulers, there's nothing to prove that that person was uh, had sympathies for the Nazi regime, which is in itself sort of interesting since so many people in, in his uh, near surrounding, wife, mother, father, brother, they were very strong Nazis and there is nothing that suggests that he was. So, I mean, one suggestion could be to keep, 
keep that. In, instead of saying von Euler's weg, you say Ulf von Euler's weg, and then you remove Hans. Um, which it's, it's sort of funny that Hans popped up anyway, because uh, the, the other people are tied to KI. Hans von Euler wasn't at KI. He was at Stockholm University. Yeah. Stockholms Högskola. Stockholms so Högskola at the time, yeah. So can I follow up quickly? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, I'm wondering whether, if you're thinking specifically about the, the interests, I'm wondering whether the KI's interest and the general society's interest are going to line up. Because it might be that some, it's bad for uh, KI to take a PR hit, but it's good for society because we get an opportunity to talk about the past and stuff. Mm. Uh, and then it just seems to me like if we're interested in whether these people deserve to be commemorated, that seems to be quite different ballpark here. Because it might turn out that whatever the von Euler person was, uh, maybe he deserved to be comm commemorated, but it just turns out that it's bad for KI, it's bad for society, and that's the reason not to commemorate him. So it seems like there's a lot of more detailed footwork that needs to be done in terms of the standards here. Yes, I, I think you're right, but I, I mean, if you want to be nuanced about anyone, putting a name tag on a lecture hall isn't really the way forward, right? So uh, we talked quite a lot about that in the group, and I f for sure hope there's something in the report uh, showing this, namely that you c there are other ways of dealing. I mean, if you would make exhibitions instead, then it's great that they haven't crushed the bust of Retzius, because that would be a, a good piece to have in an exhibition where you bring up what they achieved as KI people and what they are criticized for. And that seems to me to be the best way to learn something from history and, and where you can sort of, f from these stories perhaps learn that, well, if, if someone is, is celebrated as a sort of uncontested uh, hero, there's probably something that's not been said because for, for most people there's at least something that doesn't look as, as good as your best side. Are you happy with that? So then we move on to... Uh, we're going to get uh, the American perspective. Tim, yeah. uh, wait for the microphone. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a question about um, the anatomical collections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, it's actually kind of a two-part question, I guess. So. First, I I was a bit uh, lost, partly because I didn't... So in the, when you were talking about renaming, you had a discussion of values that could be weighed against each other, you know, reasons to keep the names, reasons to get rid of the names, and so forth. But I didn't have a, a, a clear sense of what the positive value was of keeping the anatomical collections. You, you mentioned one thing about research using them in research but what you know what kind of research and and are there other sorts of positive reasons to keep these anatomical collections because if we have a better sense of that then mm -hmm. we can think about the sort yeah. of weighing uh, more, more precisely i think at least three things uh, one is that if you destroy it then you can't uh, turn it back or uh, return it to someone. So if, say, you would burn everything and then they call you from somewhere and say, we would like to have our remains back, mm -hmm. then you have to say sorry. Uh, so that, that, that would be one reason to have it, if you think it's important that people can claim them back. Oh, so it's kind of like a lost and found, in a sense. Yeah. You can keep the thing around yes. until someone yes. comes. Yes, if you destroy it, you can't yeah. turn it back. That's I mean, sure. Uh, the other is... Uh, a potential interest for research and the third is a, the potential interest for for learning from history through sort of exhibition use and that kind of stuff oh, okay but what uh, what sort of research is this like potentially life-saving research or uh, no um, oh. one w which okay. I think is the most likely with with this collection since it isn't there are some weaknesses from a research perspective with this collection. I mean, one thing that happened was there was a great fire in late uh, 1900s, which means that the catalog that was probably uh, in, in perfect order up until then burned. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So that means all of a sudden you again didn't know what you had, even though you had known that for at least most of what was in there before. So there is a, a, a re retracing of this. Uh, so that's a weakness. Then, uh, as I said, the, there seems to have been a practice of... Um, a little bit was like you're out traveling and you, get you have the opportunity of getting hold of... A a skull from uh, Paraguay and, 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 you, and you purchase it. So you had a little bit like the, any collector's ambition of covering as much as possible about around the world. But interest in research, then it's normally much better that you have 30, 40 individuals from one tiny area and the same group, especially, uh, certainly if you're doing genetic research, you, then you don't want one. It, it, it depends on what you're doing. It could be enough. If you say you have the only something from a certain area and you can take out genetic material, then you can characterize the genome. That, then that would be okay. But okay. if you have other interests, that wouldn't yeah. be. But genetic is one. Uh, pathological research is possible in, in some cases where you have traces. You can actually if you know how to ask things with what you have, you can learn things about like the Spanish flu, which was has probably I obviously see. been an So it sounds but like it's going to be mainly historical. I was just thinking that um, if the, the research was sufficiently important, then a good way to think about the ethical issues might be to look at parallels with other kinds of cases where, um, you know, like... Uh, situations of mandatory autopsies in, in the mm, United States. Mm. Some states have these uh, laws, but it doesn't matter what the family says. If the person was murdered or something, you can do an autopsy. Um, you might t try to like look at those cases and look for parallels, but it sounds to me like the research you're thinking about isn't going to be uh, sufficiently valuable. It sounds more like historic, getting a better picture of history and things like that. I think so. you're right that it it's not likely that it will help medicine it could either be interesting for sort of genetic slash historical interest or cultural historical interest. I mean, if, if you remove the entire collection, you will not be able to have an exhibition showing how <laughs> uh, anatomical collections were used at, at medical faculties in the past. I mean, that kind of thing. That, that doesn't provide an argument for keeping everything. So that, that's, of course, also a thing. I mean... Uh, to some extent, you have in you know the individuals. Maybe it's there are some full skeletons, but often not. You know who they are. It's other times you have boxes with just bones, mm. uh, and you know, yeah, these were used for teaching because there have been sort of two kinds of uses in the past. You had it for medical students to learn the bones in the body. You got a box with the bones from a body, uh, and then you could learn. Uh, the di different bones. So that was uh, that's way before you. Now you probably get a 3D image from your computer. You don't need those anymore. Uh, I, I got one of those boxes in med school. Okay, <laughs> ah, see there. Okay, they, they were very useful actually. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I didn't know it was. Uh, I follow up quickly on that. I mean, um, even this is a rather tricky question. I mean, what can be the scientific interest of this because we mm. then have to speculate about future Use. scientific mm. methods. Mm. We didn't know that we would be able to pick out DNA from things like this if you go back. No, no, you're so right. So even that I think uh, needs a rather mm. more thorough investigation mm. involving a lot of different fields. Yeah, so but that's, I mean, since you're talking about balancing values when it comes to the first part, here you, of course, uh, is there something bad about keeping it? Otherwise, you could keep it uh, or you could keep it and repatriate. But the, I mean, some would probably argue, well, if you have talk about repatriation, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't do that because maybe the research interest would be more important or maybe not. Maybe it would just cause your... Yeah. tremendous conflicts between uh, whatever population wants to have them back, if you say that. But of course you can have discussions as one of the inputs from a uh, <laughs> Norwegian legal expert. W and she, uh, in Norway, uh, Oslo University, they have large collections of, of uh, remains from Sami people. And, and they, the, the main thing they've learned is, well, if you talk to them, <laughs> you, you can hear what they want. And they are not uninterested in research. They don't want everything back. It's okay to keep it. Uh, may they have asked to have some back. And it could be that 
some villagers or so have felt very strongly about getting their individuals back. Uh, so they have had some sort of funerals like that. But uh, the rest seems to be kept. And it's okay for research, but not any research. You, you call us before you do it, right? So it's ethical review, but also this phone call or whatever letter to the Sami representatives. And they make a decision whether they find it okay or not. So you, you shouldn't uh, sort of presuppose too much. It's better to communicate and ask people what they think. Very good. So we have now a question from um, online, uh, Mats Johansson. We're going to put you in the spotlight and hope that it will work. Um, I just wonder, uh, did you discuss naming after donors of money funding, uh, say Ingvar Kamprad's Institute for something like that? And, and can you comment on that? Because I can see that there are certain mm. strong reasons for accepting names on, on donors. Yes, I'm, well, we didn't discuss that actually in the working group, but I have had the comment afterwards. If you're, if you're killing this opportunity, you make it a bit harder to get donations. Uh, even, even if you never put their name on any of the streets, they might believe that you will when they are signing the check. Uh, so, it, so it w was, or maybe you actually do. I mean, we have at Karinsky Institute, we have uh, the largest uh, hall is from uh, uh, Erling Persson, Erling Persson Hall, for instance. So sure, if if you if you remove names, you remove the possibility uh, to tempt uh, people to 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 give large donations and in return get their name. But that's of course also, I mean, that would also be, a, yeah, it could be debated whether that's a good thing. Of course you have, you have all, all uh, rich people have donated uh, covering the, your university area. On that note, uh, join me in thanking Zet for coming here on this uh, very interesting talk, but uh, sure we'll go on more. So thank you very much. Thank you. And you're welcome back for the next uh, research seminar, the March 9th, uh, Mike Utsuka, How to Pool Risk Across Generations. And March 16th, Tim Bartley, Perception of Distant Problems, Popular Understandings of Labor and Environmental Problems in Global Supply Chain. And March 23, Jan Theorel, Commitments and Bargaining Delays in Parliamentary Democracies. So welcome back. <laughs>